So just one second, we'll only get everything kicked up. Um, so while we're loading the slides, just go ahead and get some of the intro out of the way so that we can try and stay on time, get everybody out of here. Uh, so I'm Logan Honeycutt. I'm with Barrett All Pet Foods. My business partner and I, Mike Cody, is sitting over in the corner there. I was sent up here because apparently I'm the pretty one. So what we do is we look for other alternative protein sources outside of just chicken and beef. Oh, perfect. You know, think about 10 years ago in the pet industry. If you use something besides chicken or beef, you were insane. You were going to hurt your bottom line, and retailers were telling you, why am I going to sell this? This is crazy. Nobody's going to buy it. And nowadays, we've got alligator. We've got kangaroo. We have tons and tons of options because consumers are so much more educated. educated. They have access to information that they never had before, and now they're willing to do their homework. They are willing to go out and try something new, try something different, as long as they know it's safe for their pets. And that's one of the biggest things to the barriers to entry for alternative protein sources is the lack of research, the lack of education for everyone involved, from the manufacturers down to the consumers and the retailers. So we have to create a self-sustaining system where everybody understands there's full transparency through every step of the marketplace. All right, so this is a little bit about us. These are our product lines here. It's all under our Go Bear dog. Uh, we launched two years ago, and we actually just launched Cat Treats a couple weeks ago. Sorry for that. Um, one of the biggest things is we use an invasive species as the main protein source for everything that we're doing, specifically Asian carp. So we are based in Chicago. That is ground zero for Asian carp. So just by a show of hands, who here is familiar just in general what an invasive species is? God, I love working with an educated room. It makes my job so much easier. Um, but Asian carp, they're a really bad problem outside of Chicago. And we'll dive into that just a little bit more here. So, Invasive species, they're really defined as plants or animals that humans, and that is the crux there, it is humans have introduced into a system, whether on purpose or accidentally, but it doesn't change the fact that they are capable of breaking the food web or really whatever it might be because they have no natural predators and that's gonna be the biggest change. So whether it's predators from the animal world or from the human side through consumption. Um, but as you can see, the red list, that's a group that tracks all of the, all of the endangered species. And of 170 species with a list of cause of extinction, 91 were invasive species as a contributing factor. And for the sole factor for 34 species. So what this, I want to take you back. Does anybody know about the issues with rats and islands? Just a couple people. So back in the 1700s, sailors, British sailors sailing around the ocean, they'd stop at a beautiful little island and they'd put in for water, supplies, everything. But the rats that were on board, they would get off and they would then crawl around and start entwining themselves in the ecosystem. But based on the tropical climates, it actually screwed up their breeding patterns. So now they used to breed in Europe just uh, once a cycle, once a year. And now they were breeding continuously and they were looking for new food sources. So they killed off thousands of bird species all over the Pacific. They're no longer, they're just completely gone because of rats. So it's an example of even through an accidental issue, humans have destroyed irreparably ton ecosystems, um, including the flora and the fauna. But um, this is one stat that really, it really gets me at my core. 42% of threatened or endangered species are because of invasive species. And that's something that we have to change in the short term as opposed to waiting for the long term for someone else to handle it. So let's talk specifically about Asian carp. So as you can see on these maps here, Asian carp in 1975, they were brought over into Mississippi to clean out fish farms because they are filter feeders, they eat algae and plankton. And that's uh, their primary diet which is actually what makes them so bad for the environment because that's what all of our native fish species need to survive. When they hatch, that's what they all eat. And Asian carp, they break that food web. So you can see on the left, 1975, they got flooded out in the Mississippi. Not a big deal. Eh, it's fine, not gonna be a problem. Well, as you can see in 2011, they are all over the central United States. Any river system connected to the Mississippi River in some way, whether it's a tributary, or it's a different river, whatever it might be, they have Asian carp in there now. And what we're trying to prevent 
is Asian carp getting into the Great Lakes. Because if they get into the Great Lakes, they are going to shatter the entire food web in that area. So as you can see, they can get up over 100 pounds. There's three different varieties. There's big head, silver carp, and grass carp. Well, big head carp, they're literally over 100 pounds. We're talking about a fish that big that eats 40% of its body weight daily. So <laughs> any areas that they go to, native populations are decimated, native fish species. All right, so here's a fun little video. Let me see if I can get this to play. You may have to hit it manually. I'm not that good at PowerPoint. I don't know how to make it play on its own. Yeah, I don't know. It might be buffering or something. So while it's going on, um, so many of you may have seen videos of Asian carp. Uh, anytime a boat goes over the water, they have something in their brain, how they're wired. Uh, they are trying to avoid danger, and they view boats, the vibration of boats, as a signal, predator, get away. So they jump out of the water, and I personally find it kind of funny. I know it's sad, but when people get hit by them, they, it's, there's boaters, people are water skiing, and they just get smashed by a fish. What well, you don't realize, those fish can get up over 40 pounds. So you're being hit by a fish, you're going 30 miles an hour in a boat, you're being hit by a fish going the opposite direction, it's 40 pounds, you're talking broken jaws, broken noses, broken bones, like serious, serious damage to these boaters. And that's just the ones you can see. There's two other varieties down there that are doing massive damage. So, I mean, we can go ahead and skip it. I recommend you look at those videos, they're, they're good for a laugh. All right, so we'll go to the next slide here. So, like I said, we're based out of Chicago, so we're kind of down on that southern end of, the, of Lake Michigan there. And if they get in, they are going to kill the entire salmon population. People don't understand, that's about $7 billion a year in economic activity that you can track. That doesn't even count the environmental issues that it's gonna cause. But think of the Great Lakes as a highway. So this is gonna enable them to get up into Canada, and we're talking pristine waterways. Is anybody else in here a fisherman? Yeah, we, we've got a couple. So these are pristine waterways. They're self-sustaining ecosystems that in, without the presence of humans, they would survive for thousands and thousands of years. If Asian carp get in there, all of a sudden, they're competing directly with these fish for their food sources, and it's gonna crowd them out until they're no longer existing. And for me, one of the things that I wanna see never happen in the St. Lawrence Seaway the white sturgeon, they're one of the last ancient bony fish. Well, they eat the same food source as Asian carp. And we're talking about a fish that's millions of years old and through humans, hubris is the word that comes to mind, we are now gonna kill off one of the last ancient species on our planet. So what we're trying to do is use a market-based solution. So a lot of, there's a lot of companies that they do something that's slightly better for the environment, and that's great. That is that incremental step. And we wanna illustrate how you can leverage a market-based solution to do something that is tremendously good for the environment. So that it's not just like, hey, we're gonna do something just slightly better. So we wanna show people how you can use a for-profit company to do something that will make that tremendous change. So other areas that we're exploring, and so Asian carp, that's our protein. That's one of the main inputs. But we can look at it through other sections in our supply chain what are we doing with our packaging? What are we doing with our sourcing for that? What are we doing on the shelf? How are we actually presenting it? Um, one of the biggest things, has somebody in here worked in category management? So I did a lot of category management and shopper marketing in my past life. You wouldn't understand, think about all those shelf headers you see on the shelf. Well, say they get a million of those printed, but it turns out that they're the wrong size. What do they do with them? They chuck it, it's gone. It's an absolute 100% waste Whereas maybe if they were using a different material source, which um, kudzu vines, it's a leafy green, it's a vine that was introduced in the Southern United States. It's perfect for fibers. So uh, somebody mentioned that they did something with fibers earlier that I thought was really interesting. So you could use this potentially as a source for your printing materials. So just different things that you can do in the short and the long term. 
So I just thought this was a great visual representation. So down in Florida, lionfish. You know, they're beautiful. Everybody's seen them, but they don't realize how devastating they are to the environment. They're actually super dangerous to scuba divers. If anybody's a scuba diver, they will actually attack you. And they have poisonous spines, so that can get a little bit sticky. But they're causing a lot of environmental devastation to the coral reefs, everything along with that. Uh, Burmese pythons in Florida, as in, I'm not sure if anybody's heard about this, but they're actually starting to attack alligators, crocodiles, the deer populations down there. And that's what that one, it actually just ate a deer. So that's what you're seeing there. And they're becoming the apex predator in this system that already had a well-established pattern of apex predators. Uh, feral hogs down in Texas, you know, they're, you can see it, it's eating a deer. They're causing a lot of breaks in those chains. But one thing that people don't think about is plants as an invasive species. So they're gonna cause a lot of damage too. So this is the kudzu vine. If anybody in here is from the south, just drive around Atlanta and you will see this thing everywhere. It grows over a foot a day. And that used to be somebody's house. So this little thing you see here, that's a home. This is where somebody used to live until this creeping vine that comes from Southeast Asia took over their entire farm. And they can't do anything about it because it's very, very difficult to get at the root cause and pull it out of the ground. So what uh, we're looking at here now is some of the challenges when you're looking at doing something different through your supply chain. It is very hard to build a supply chain from scratch. I would love to be able to call somebody and say, hey, we need 10,000 pounds of chicken. That's so easy. What we have to do is we had to actually contract with local fishermen. We have to go out and say, hey, we need 20,000 pounds of Asian carp. And that's something that's very, very challenging. It adds a big step into your supply chain. But at the end of the day, we actually found a major benefit from this, where Asian carp have put a lot of commercial fishermen out of business, because you are legally not allowed to throw it back. So we put them out there, they get a job. Once we create demand, it's gonna drive everything forward. Um, just shopper knowledge, you know, it's something different. It's something unique. Um, environmental issues, not that many people are up to date on all these things that we know about. So that's one thing you have to keep in mind. Lack of research, very, very important. And societal malaise. We ask people to care about 100 different things at any given time. How do you break through? and get them to truly care about this thing that you're passionate about, but maybe they're not. So, all right, so that, that's my time. Absolutely.